special guest today who I'm 100% certain uh, you're all going to find incredibly interesting. Um, our guest has a very extensive background in business, sport, and of course, wine. And his story is definitely interesting and intriguing. Um, and as I was just saying a second ago, I, I when I was studying this and writing it out, I, I had to stop myself and um, because we always try in our format to keep it within an hour or so. Uh, I think for the people that are really wine geeks, um, you're going to love what we're going to do today completely because um, we're going to be discussing a grape that myself included, a lot of us didn't know what it was until, uh, until we had experience with it, and that is Negret. Um, and I know our guests will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a really big part of his passion for wine in this winery, Chateau Clement, that he owns is actually the grape. Um, so we're going to be discussing that. We're going to be discussing the amazing Appalachian Fronton, which I don't know anywhere near as much as I wish I knew about. And uh, we'll definitely save a few minutes at the end for questions. So make sure you save your questions. Without further delay, a big welcome to Mr. Stefan Heppelman, the owner of Chateau Clement. Welcome. Oh. Yes, thank you very much. Oh, that's great. It's great to have you. So, Stefan, before we get into the uh, Fronton Appalachian and the Great Regret, I read your biography and your background. And you absolutely have uh, one of the most ex interesting and extensive uh, of anybody that I've interviewed in, you know, with your personal history. As I read your resume, I couldn't help but think you've lived an incredibly full life and you're a young man. Um, you've got a lot, of, a lot of things that you've done. So um, tell everybody a little bit about your heritage, your education, your background. Um, yeah. I will do so. Thank you very much, uh, Van. Um, you know, people say as a consultant, you live a dog life. Um, you live like a dog. Well, the, the, the good side about that is you live actually seven times as much as a normal human would live. So this is how that comes. Um, I'm, I'm mid 40 ish right now. I'm 45 years old. Um, I'm uh, born as a German. So I, you will see that tonight. I'm quite structured and I try to lay out things, you know, in, a, in an ordinated form. Um, very early in my, in my youth, um, 20 years old, I, I lived in France, I discovered France, and I would say I'm by heart, I'm a Frenchman. Um, so um, that's kind of the two poles in my side. So it's on one side, uh, order, structure, what the Germans call perfection. And then on the other side, um, the chaos that the French call creativity. Uh, okay. Um, now, um, about the business side, um, a little bit. Uh, so I'm, I'm working now for 20 years as a strategy consultant with uh, large corporations, multi-billion corporations, um, typically with their boards on strategy, on organizational issues. Um, companies like uh, Bosch, you might know, uh, as an automotive supplier, ZF, you might know, uh, Osram, Sylvania. The lightings, uh, I, I helped um, sell them to Chinese uh, two years ago. Um, I've been working for a long, very long time in the reinsurance industry for uh, Swiss Re, uh, which might also be known in, in financial services. So the, the company I'm working for is uh, Stern Stewart. Um, so Joel Stern and Bennett Stewart, there were two investment banking guys in New York who created that, that firm in the 80s. And I joined them um, somewhere in the late 90s. Um, and I, I took over the company um, somewhere 15 years ago uh, with my German partners here. Now we are running with a partner team of 15 people running that company worldwide now. Um, and I am one of those associates in there. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the, the consulting side of what I do. And 10 years ago, um, I said, well, actually, I, I need to get back. And I think we'll touch on that a little bit later back on, on the wine side of, of uh, you know, what, what I love, what I'm really fond of. Um, and, and I invested so in, in Chateau Clamas. And uh, since then, I'm, I'm running that, uh, that wine business as well. Interesting. So you're obviously an accomplished and very successful business person. You decided to get into the wine business or you had been in it before or you, is Chateau Clamas your first entree into it? And then tell us a little bit about where you went to school. Cause I think, I know we have one guest here that will find uh, where you went to school very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so actually, I uh, and this I was listening before to that uh, sabring, you know. So actually, I, I went to school in in Champagne in Reims, um, which uh, actually opened up many things and many sides of my personality. So a 
if you do, uh, you know, university nights, uh, prom night, etc., with champagne, well, that's classic, isn't it? Um, all those champagne uh, houses, they sponsor that university. Um, so, you know, you, you, we always had the champagne, you know, flowing, pouring like that uh, at, at student parties. So that was great. Um, so wine, you know, uh, at Reims is, is one of the key things there. The other side is, is uh, I, I played rugby there. Um, um, you know, for Americans, it's, it's, it's funny, might be funny. I don't know if you know American football versus rugby. You know the difference? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So basically, it's the same sport, but without any protection, right? Right. <laughs> Right. There, 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 is, there is protection, though, because basically, you know, you tape your ears. So that's basically the protection so to prevent others from, you know, ripping them off. So, <laughs> um, so, so um, I had some, some really good friends there at university where I was playing with them rugby, etc. So I learned that. I learned that a lot. And, and uh, even, you know, we did the university championship together and, and I played in the semifinals. So. Unfortunately, we lost in the semifinals, but otherwise I, I could call myself a, a university rugby final player. Um, well, the semifinals is already quite a, quite a lot of things. So that's, that's also kind of funny thing, you know, about France and about rugby. Those who know rugby, rugby is, is very much about values. It's very much about uh, how to, you know, connect with people. Actually, at rugby, it's, it's not necessarily the better single players that win, but the better team. So team spirit is quite important there. And that is um, also a very fun, fun connection to what, you know, later I learned um, uh, I would find in, in, in Fronton. Because um, you might know or might not know, but Toulouse is the, the high capital of rugby. Huh. It's the southwest. So, um, you know, it's, it's really the area where in France people well, live to that sport, live up to that values of team spirit, of, of, of rugby, etc. So that's, um, you know. And then there's the third thing. And there's the third W. You know, we have that Southwest, the values of rugby. We have the vine. And then there's the third thing I, 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 I learned in Reims, which is uh, I learned to, 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 to meet French women, uh, and most important of which, my wife. <laughs> And uh, I'm still with her after uh, almost 20 years of marriage. So um, I think that's, that's also, a, well, a good learning there in Rath. Right. <laughs> well, you're always learning, right? <laughs> I'm always learning. <laughs> <laughs> so you took your success and you invested into a winery, Chateau Clement. Um, what year did you make that purchase? What year did you make that leap? That was 2012. So that's, uh, that's almost uh, eight years ago now. Right. And, th and that particular winery had been in existence for a while, right? Yeah, it's almost, almost uh, 150 years. Well, it's 150 years last year, so that was uh, 140 something years. Interesting. So, uh, quite a long heritage. And, um, and the funny thing about that one is, is, is you know, well, I, I was looking for something special. I, was, I wanted to get back to Southwest. I wanted to get, you know, where, that, where people live for having good food, for having good wine, etc. And I was looking for something special. I, I really wanted to find, you know, that, you know, what we call the hidden treasure. Um, and that's not that easy because, um, well, you know, if you, if you talk about wine, th there are well-known appellations. Um, you have, you know, that, that story of, uh, of Cao with uh, their star, a grape, you know, being pushed by, by the Latin Americans, etc. So it's, it's difficult to find something that people don't know and to still see the treasure in that. And, and that's basically how I got in touch with Fronton, how I got in touch with Negret. And just by tasting those grapes and by tasting the, the vines that, that Jean-Michel made at the time, I said, it's, it's, it's impossible that this is not sold out of, outside of France yet. And, and well, this is how we you know, started doing things together. It totally captivated you. That's a great story. So. Um, before we, and we are going to get uh, deeper into the Appalachian into the great because I'm I definitely like I said I've got a lot to learn myself here so as a successful business person you're how how different is is the mindset running a winery than it is um, in some of the other businesses that you've that you've done yeah it's this is this is this is a good question because actually in my heart I'm an entrepreneur so running a consulting business or running a winery um, has lots of things in common. 
yeah. because it's 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 much about the people and and having people who are really enthusiastic about what they do. You now, when when we recruit a consultant, I'm I'm well. This is bright people. This is talented people. Good in university, but but what I'm looking for is the glowing in their eyes. You now, do do they really burn for something? And that's a, definitely the same the same thing also for Chateau Clamont's team. So. Uh, Jean-Michel had that glowing in, in his eyes and, and basically so, you know, this is how we connected. But then we, he had people on there, uh, his first man, very good guy, uh, uh, talented, always looking for solutions. Uh, we recruited Charlotte together. We recruited some other people. So, you know, we made that team. And I think that's, that's a really important ingredient for, for both of the businesses. Um, the, the other side that's interesting is, is kind of, you know, product turnaround. So I was talking about Sylvania and Ostrom business. So LEDs, you know, LED lighting. Yeah. Well, it's not that different from wine because, and that's fun because look at, look at Rosé basically has nine months of product life. Okay. So you need to, you, you, right, right now I have to define how I'm going to sell next year. Right. Well, the LED business is the same thing. So, you know, Sylvania needed to decide now how much they are going to, ch to, to, to sell at Walmart or at Costco next year. And once you, you fix that, you can't change that any longer. Um, you have, you know, all that shipping. Well, we had the discussion then. We need to fix together at what, po what point in time you're going to import. You fix the, the, the volume and then, well, either it's done or it's not. And, you know, this thing is, is, is really comparable there. But then there's another side, it's, it's, it's the creative side, it's the marketing side, it's the, the branding side of that, uh, um, which is well, much more hands-on. So, you know, not talking about millions or billions, but it's just kind of saying, well, do we need to print those 5,000 new labels or don't we print them? You know? Right. So that's, that's, really, that's really a good point. Interesting. Did you have a, a, a lot of uh, challenges and obstacles to overcome when you when you make, when you bought the winery? Sorry, what to overcome? I'm, I'm didn't get this. Did you have a lot of challenges and obstacles? Ah, yes. Were yes. Yes. Actually, um, you know, we that, that winery was well run, but you know, we wanted to bring that to a completely new level. So, you know, when we when we recreated the rosé, I wanted to have a rosé which is very light, um, but still very arom aromatic. So how, how did we get there? We, we completely reinvented the chain. So, you know, me not being really from the business, like I'm not in my consultant business also every day, I'm, I'm challenging all the habits, I'm challenging all the routines. And I was doing that as well for the rosé. So what did we do? A, we harvest the rosé at the latest point in time possible. But then we need to bring that very quickly to the seller because, well, if it's late, there's potentially a lot of color in there and color to get into the wine. So basically, you need to be really, really quick in, in pressing it out. So we have typically just 20 minutes between harvest and pressing in the cellar. Wow. So, so that's kind of, you know, one of the secrets. And then there is a lot about, you know, cooling cooling down so we needed to install a new cooling system we needed to think about how to 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 keep the wine very very chilled down to prevent well basically to get the aroma the perfume but to prevent it from from uh, changing from getting the the alcohol too quickly um and we we had a long you know discussions and thinking uh, around that one as well um until one day basically it's it, it, the milk one was just kind of you know running in front of our uh, Chateau Clamence, you know that that large uh, uh, lorry, um, getting the milk from from one of our neighbors, and we're saying, well, why didn't we think about that? You know those those dairy farms, they have containers to cool the milk down to two or three degrees and to keep it at that point in time for quite a long time, hmm. and that's completely hermetic. So basically, we, we went to a milk farm to a dairy you know supplier, and said. Well, how can we buy those containers? We, and we want to use that for, for making wine. And they say, well, we, why do you want to use that for making wine? We say, well, we need that for rosé because that way, basically, we keep the aroma for almost three weeks while part of the wine is already starting to, to 
well, to change from juice to, to, to wine. So um, now that transformation, that alcoholic, first alcoholic transformation, and we just reintegrate the aroma afterwards, not to, not to, to, to break those structures. In there. So, you know, this, this, this kind of things is, if you want to have a top shot product, you really need to kind of think everything from, from the beginning on. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, that's great. Well, it, 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 uh, it definitely shows in the, in the wine. There's no question about that. So I want to switch gears a little bit now and get focused on the Appalachian and the grapes that you grow in uh, Fronton. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you have a very uh, vast background experience. You were obviously successful. You chose that Appalachian that, um, frankly, I had not heard of until uh, uh, Emmanuel Montes introduced me to Charlotte. I'd, I'd never heard of the Appalachian and, and didn't know anything about it. Um, so, so, and I need to tell the, the, the audience that's listening, which probably the most impactful wine, or, uh, sorry, the, the most, um, uh, impulsive purchase I ever made was at your winery. And, uh, I went in, uh, uh, probably a week or two before Christmas in 2017 and I tasted the wine, the rosé actually. And I said, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't need to know anything about it other than can I get a couple hundred cases of it. That is absolutely spectacular wine. And when can we put it on the water? Um, it was the most impulsive thing I ever did. And then, and then we talked about the price and everything else. It's, and that's not the way you're supposed to negotiate, actually. But that, that <laughs> wine is that good, right? So, um, um, before, right before, you know, we, we did that. I was blown away. I'm going to make a very big statement to this day. It's probably one of the best rosé wines I've ever had. So for anybody that has not uh, had a chance to, to taste it. You, it's get a hold of us and let's let's make sure you get a chance to to try the wine. It's really 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 delicious. Um, but why Fronton? That's that's my my question. That's what I was leading up to. Let, so let's start with the AOC Fronton. Why Fronton? What what what? I, I think you did say earlier that part of it was you could find something there you couldn't find anywhere else. Yeah, actually, the, you know the, the the so actually Fronton is quite small. You know, as an appellation, it's two thousand hectares. It's, it's 40, you know, local producers, and then it's, it's an associate wine association um, being accounting for almost 40% of the, of the surface. So it's, it's small, it's young. So it was only uh, installed as an appellation in 1975, hmm. which means, and that's, I think, the key driver why it's unknown. It has something special, which is that negret, which is at least 50% of all the charges in, in our wines. And then there is that funny thing, it has a very, very, very long heritage. So the first Fronton wine mentioned in the books is 1000, in year 1056. Wow. So this is more than 900 years ago, wine was produced on the soils where we are right now. Okay. So this is really long times ago. We, we have, you know, the, 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 the French have that Cardinal Richelieu whom you might know from history. He was uh, siaging Montauban, which is kind of the next village. Um, and basically during the siage, him and his opponent were, you know, just kind of drinking Fonton wines while the soldiers were kind of, you know, battling each other. Um, yeah, it, this is there's a really rich history uh, around that. And now comes the, the funny thing about that. In, in the 18th uh, century, um, Fronton was dependent from the Bordeaux uh, uh, Duke, so from the Bordeaux uh, 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 noble. And so um, the Bordeaux winemakers, you know, they wanted to have protectionist right, like we have right now. You know, we can talk about politics even tonight. So you know, what happened there is the, the, at that point in time, protectionists, they said, well, actually, you need you uh, ruler here in Bordeaux. You need to protect your wineries in Bordeaux. And so basically he said, um, well, whenever um, in Bordeaux all the cellars are empty, you have the right to sell other wines than that one directly coming from Bordeaux in Bordeaux, which means that Fronton was never sold as Fronton but you know the the Gironde, which is the, the 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 river linking the two cities. So we are I don't know 120 kilometers away. So this is an hour, an hour and a half drive. Um, uh, we are south, so we have a little bit more sun than they have. You know, so this is why our wines probably are better. 
Um, <laughs> but what happened is at that point in time, 200 years ago, that the wine was coming from Fronton, was shipped to Bordeaux on the, on the Gironde, on the river, changing about 25 times, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in that huge barrels, changing at each time the, the owner. And when it arrived, you know, all of a miracle, it was being Bordeaux wine. So this is why, you know, there is good quality, there is good soil, there's a long tradition, but there's no marketing at all. Um, I think um, when I started, there was something like 15% of the overall production of that, you know, of, of Fronton, of that Appellation, which was being sold outside France. Um, so, you know, as a businessman, I said, well, there's a huge opportunity to, to have people discover that. Um, to have people understand that, hear that, learn that, and just kind of see what what great um, aroma also those those you know those wines have to to offer. Interesting. Huh. Um, well, that actually you asked answered one of my questions. I said, is there a his, historical aspect of Fronton that is really an interesting story? And you just told us. I mean that that's pretty uh, pretty fascinating. And I didn't realize that. Um, I've been there obviously uh, a couple times and I didn't realize it was that close to, to Bordeaux. So, um, yep. and it, you, you said there, how many chateaux are there in the AOC? It's roughly 40. It's uh, 36 or 37 right now. Plus, you know, that huge uh, wine growers association. Yeah. And you said uh, 2000 hectares for the, the entire. Yes. Also roughly. Exactly. Right. So that is, that is very small. And what are all the varietals that are grown in the AOC and what, is there a requirement in the AOC to have a, um, a certain amount of uh, negrette or is that that's something you do? No, yeah, actually it's, it's, it's a requirement. And that was part of, you know, when, when those wine growers started to install the Appalachian 1975, they said, well, how can we be different? Um, we have that negrette. So if we still want to be the same, all of us, or try to, you know, have something specific to Fronton, let's make Negrette our star. So this is why in the beginning they said 50% in every wine, in every bottle, having the Fronton appellation needs to be Negrette. Um, right now they changed that six years ago and we said, well, actually it's, it must be the dominant part. So if we have three different varieties, it can also be just 40% or 45% as long as it's the dominant part. Right. Um, so all of our wines, red and rosé, will be marked by uh, Negrette. And then basically the next ones are Syrah as the variety which we have, well, which we have on the vineyard and which is also quite frequent there. We have Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon being the net next ones. Um, and then you have, you know, other varieties up to 5%. Uh, we, for example, use uh, quite a lot of, of cot, uh, so which is, which is also known, uh, you know, in Merlot, uh, sorry, in, um, in um, uh, Cahors uh, and in, in, in um, Latin America as, um, oh, what's, what's their name? I'm sorry, just have that, that um, hold there in my memory. Right. But, but don't mind, never mind. But you know the, the, the important one is is Negret, and this is also where we where we built uh, our strategy and our um, changes around that one. Right, interesting. Um, and then for whites, you can do Chard Chardonnay. Yes, we do that. Uh, but this is not this is outside the Appellation, so there is no white decree on the Appellation. So we do that. We have a Chardonnay. And uh, we have a Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. okay. And then we have, and when, and then we have that half sweet, which is also, uh, also uh, a, a local variety, which is Gros Monsang. I, I don't know if you heard about that one. Um, so this is a half sweet, which we also have and which we produce. But all of those, basically, either we could have them as a regional variety, so IGP, Comte Tolosan. Um, or, and that's what we do, we just kind of produce them as Vin de France. Um, and that is basically because they're, you know, in there, and that's now if we talk about the wine business side of it, the, 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 the French tried to install a system 
and they have very mark, very much smart minds like that, where they said, well, appellation, I would say that's the high end, then EGP is somehow, you know, middle wine, middle quality, and Van de France is low quality. Um, so, which means that sometimes producers fix prices to that, and EGP, Comte de in the minds of consumers has a given price point. Whereas Van de France, some of the wine producers, and we as well, um, achieved to get there, we, we kind of went out of that system. We said, well, basically our best wines, good wines, not, not necessarily the best, but really good wines, very good quality wines, we position them as Van de France, because we want completely to get, to get out of that system. We want to get out of the, you know, out of the structures in there. Mm. And that might be the French side, you know, the French chaotic side rather than the German side. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that, that was just kind of to, to get there as well. The, the French, sometimes they are very much attached to that. Um, during my, my studies, I, I just kind of, you know, lived all those, also that situation, which just for me made it easy to, to get out. Because if you want to access a university, elite university in France, this is called Grande École. And you know they have that that classification of you know this this uh, this university is at that rank and like the Ivy League in in the U.S. You know, so if you're in, that's great. If you're out, well, so and I was having job interviews with French companies, and they were saying, well, now where in the ranking is that university in Reims? Okay, so they were looking in their rankings, etc. And I was you know just saying, well, look. Actually, I didn't enter that university through like any Frenchman, but I entered through the German university. Now, if you want to look in your ranking, you know, look at that German ranking, call up your Frankfurt colleagues and ask them what is the value of that German ranked university. So playing with rankings and playing with how people structure their ideas uh, is something which I learned very early on. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, so the star bridal in Fronton is Negret. And tell us a little bit about why that is. The, 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 actually, it's, it's, it's on the red side. Um, it is really rich. It, has a, it produces wines of a really dark red, almost violet color. And um, the aroma... Um, is very much varying as well from when you harvest it. So basically in the beginning, it's quite pepperous. It's uh, more like, you know, young uh, red berry fruit. Whereas um, at the end to over maturity, it gets very, very uh, sugar rich and almost like marmalade, you know, like red fruit, marmalade, berries, cherry, those kind of aromas. Um, and, you know, um, as I said, on, on the rosé, on the red as well, we were experimenting, trying to say, well, shouldn't we do a blend, 100% negret, but just a blend of young and of very mature harvested grapes, because that would feel like, uh, you know, um, uh, mixing or blending two different grape varieties. So you have a really rich aromatic, uh, aromatic band on the red side, which is interesting. So that is, is really good. And then on the rosé side, um, this is very rich in aroma, as I said before. Um, if you get it to the right point of maturity, this is difficult because it's about half a day of harvesting. So mm. if you are just one day too late, then you're over the point. And if you're just kind of, you know, half a day too early, then you're not fully yet there on that aroma side. But if you get the right point and if you get the right spot, as I said before, you have that, you know, Provence type color, very pale, very transparent, but it's kind of, I feel personally, it's kind of 10 times the more uh, aromatic intensity of that. And that is Negret who is really supporting that and who's really kind of driving that. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think that uh, that's one of the things that is, uh, is really interesting about uh, your rosé is that it walks that fine line uh, you know, you, you're looking at it in the glass in the bottle and, and then you take it to your nose. You're like, that is a, I mean, that's a pretty big wine. Right. And then, and then on the palate though, it, it's 
the acidity is beautiful and you know the richness is there it, the, the balance is just spectacular it's perfect and there and the other thing that's interesting is um I don't know how you manage the tannins. I guess it's be just really minimize the skin contact because in the rouge, obviously, you can you can yes. really pick up the tannins, but not in the rosé. Yes. Exactly, and that's exactly the point. So it's it's in itself, it's very fruity. The acids and the tannins are not getting out of this out of the the skin of the grape so quickly. So actually, if you press early enough, you get the fruit but you don't get the tannins and that's what we try to do. And you don't get the, the color either. So that's really kind of, you know, where we try to, to tweak the whole process. Huh. Where, where is uh, Negret originally from? Is it? Well, that's a, yeah, that's, that's a good question. People think it might come from Syracuse. Um, it might, it might come from the Romans, as I said. So the, the, the first mentioning is, is 900 years old. Um, it seems that the Templars, we're bringing, well, we're, we're the first ones settling there and planting wine. So, well, people believe now that might be one of the origins. So coming with Templars either from, from Syracuse or coming um, from um, uh, Cyprus. Um, mm -hmm. but, but actually, it's, it's, it's really unique. So it's, it's, well, Fronton, very much so. A little bit kind of, you know, if you throw 50 kilometers around Fronton, you still find some of them. And then there is, um, there was for 20 years or so, um, three, four hectares somewhere in California, um, huh. where that grape, yeah, where that grape was called Pinot San George. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. But that was quite small surface. And uh, to my understanding, that vanished. So this is no longer existing. But that was kind of the same grape variety, the same tree, basically, then in our event. I'm a little bit surprised that there isn't any in uh, the Languedoc. Yeah. Is they, I, I, can, well, I can tell you, actually, as a businessman, <laughs> choosing Negret is, is, is completely stupid. Huh. Um, <laughs> because if you think about what makes the cost in the vineyard, then it's manual labor. So it's cutting the, you know, cutting the wine. And basically, Negret is pushing quite quickly. You know, well, before the call, we just discussed quickly on the grass. Don't talk about Negret. You know, we need to cut the tops um, normally twice a season. But if it rains a lot and there's a lot of sun, you might go up to four or five times cutting the tops per season because it's really vigorous. It's really pushing. Um, so that's kind of, you know, it, leads, it needs a lot of, of attention. Um, Right now, we had that, the, the point basically, you know, so you need to, to, to get the, the, the metal um, lines down, um, you know, early in, 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 in spring. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to cut the grass. So we put the, the, all the lines up, wanted to cut the grass while it started to, to rain. So we couldn't go with the, the lorry in, we couldn't cut the grass. So basically, well, we, need to, we needed to put it back down. And, and, and basically, so the negret is, is driving a lot of that manual work in the vineyard. Okay. Second, it's, um, it's uh, very difficult in timing. You know, there, there are other varieties. You just plant them, you just cut them twice, and then at the end, you just kind of, you know, pass by, get the grapes. So that's not negret. Negret really needs a lot of work and a lot of attention. But I think at the end, you feel that in, in, in your glass. And it's worth it in terms of aroma. So it makes it different. And it's just kind of, you know, not like any of those mass mines you, you find somewhere else. So this is why at the end still, even as a businessman, I stay at that variety. Um, but it's, it's, well, it's not an easy choice. Right. And you just, you pretty much just explained why it's not grown in a lot of places because it's, it's, uh, it's exactly. not great to grow. Interesting. Um, is it grown? It, outside of France anywhere that you're aware of or? So, uh, the, the only place I, I'm aware of was that uh, Pinot San George in, in California. Uh, but I, well, I'm, what I understood is that they ceased. I, I'm not sure if that's still there. Interesting. Huh. I'm actually a little bit surprised somebody in California hasn't, um, you know, dialed up somebody that they know in Fronton and said, we wanna, we wanna try, try our hand at it again. That's actually a little bit, uh, a little bit surprising. Um, is there anything else 
that you want everybody in the audience to know that's specific to Negret that you think uh, you think is really important. You, you covered a lot of it, then, and, uh, and I think there, there I is there, there is one thing actually which I personally find very interesting because you know if you go to professional wine tastings, you always have those you know well oh that's good oh that's good but it's not perfect or whatever. But with Negret, I personally have the experience. It's either you love it. And if you love it, you're really in for it. Or you say, hmm, I don't know. That's not my type of wine. So it's, it's and, and I think this is special. But you will, once you've tasted it, you will always recognize it again. Hmm. Um, and it's the majority, the large majority of people who say, I love it and who are in for it forever. Um, so that's kind of, you know, I think quite interesting because, um, I haven't sensed that with other great varieties that much. And, you know, it's, I, I think I said that at the beginning. For me, actually, wine is a social product. Wine is about, you know, having people talk to each other, sitting around that glass of wine like we do, you know. I mean, all of us, I feel, have a glass of wine with us tonight, even digitally, you know. Um, so we talk about that, we discuss that. And, um, and what I feel is Negret is is special is is giving food for that giving you know um and you and you will always well discover find if there's just a uh, you know um a, a portion of negret in in one of the wines or in some of the wines you will always differentiate that interesting yeah i, I it is very unique you're you know uh, of course uh, a, a blind tasting and a double blind tasting will will humble any any wine professional and I would like to think though um, that I could blind taste Negret now and pick it out because uh, it's you are correct it's definitely a different uh, different animal and that rosé is oh, that rosé is something so all right let's swing back to um, your property Chateau Clemence um, uh, how many hectare of vineyards do you own? Uh, 30 roughly 30 Hector. It's pretty good. That's a pretty good sized chunk of land. And, um, and how many different wines are you producing? Um, so we're producing um, uh, one rosé. We're producing um, three reds. One it's oaked. Um, one, let's say, more entry level, low tannins, very fruity. And then one which is basically the, the equivalent, let's say, to the rosé, the chateau in, in, in red as well. Um, which is more structured, but which is also very much, you know, bringing out Negret in it. So um, that's basically it. And then on the white side, um, we had two only, and we have now added a third one, um, two dry ones, you know, rather for fish, and then one semi-dry rather as an aperitif. Mm. Any uh, thoughts on sparkling at all? Um, yeah, also funny thing, you know, I said we, we experiment a lot. Um, I was... Um, I was trying to create a bubbling rosé and I was trying to create a bubbling rouge, a bubbling red one. Huh. Um, and actually both experiments were not that much uh, succeeding. So we <laughs> dropped that. Right, right. Uh, um. Um, so on, on white ones, um, I don't think that, you know, the, the white grapes we have are, are good to make sparkling wine. So this is why, you know, I, I, I think they are made to be still. It's this is they are not dry enough, not you know sharp enough to put them on on, on bubbling wine. Yeah, I know uh, we we have uh, um, two of your wines in stock. We actually we need to order um, some more, and we've got the label approval on the entry level wine. Um, mm -hmm. So I know we're gonna we're gonna be placing an order and and getting those. Um, because uh, we, we do have people that are really, really, really big in the wine. So they're, they're just exceptional wines. And I think, I think we've got more uh, work that we can do around the country. We just had this little bit of this uh, problem with the, the tariff situation. And then that fortunately yeah. we dodged that one. And then the, uh, then the coronavirus. So um, it's been a little, little challenging. So um, how many cases of wine are you making? And how many different countries are you selling to right now? Um, we're doing, um, so if we talk about cases of six, we do something in the 25,000 range, mm -hmm. 20 to 25,000 range. Um, countries is, um, the largest ones, um, for the time being, and I hope I still can say that in two years time is next to the U S uh, China, 
Mm. <laughs> I hope no boat will continue. Mm -hmm. um, Canada, uh, we have been listed by the LCBO um, uh, quite a few times uh, in Ontario. Um, we have a little bit um, uh, in Asia, Sri Lanka, Hong Kong. Um, then in Europe, of course, Belgium is, is quite important for France. Uh, for friends wine export we are in germany of course as i said i'm german um poland um yeah so i would say some 15 countries now oh that's wonderful that's that's wonderful well we enjoy working with charlotte by the way she's uh, absolutely wonderful she's great she yeah she, she has that glowing doesn't she <laughs> we I, were, was, I was saying before now she, she does right yeah she's uh, she was in uh, north carolina with our partners there right before this whole mess blew up and yes. Uh, they literally fell in love with her. They said, you're more than welcome. Anytime you can come back, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they had a, they had a really great time with her. And, and our partner down there said that, uh, this could be a, a very significant part of our business. We just have to get all this other stuff behind us. So, okay. Well, is there anything before we, I have a couple of questions. So I always like to ask my guests a couple of questions on that don't have anything to do with food or business. Um, and I'm going to do that, but before I do that, is there anything that I haven't covered or anything that you would like to, to let the group know about that uh, maybe a question I missed or didn't ask? I think uh, we have covered quite a lot, but I'm not sure if, if all the others have questions. Well, I'm going to turn it over to them in a minute. I, I would okay. assume there's good. going to be a couple questions. Uh, but before, before I let them have their way with uh, asking questions, I, I have to ask you, um, what's your favorite food? I ask every, I, I, nobody can get away without, uh, without talking about their favorite food with me. I, I have to admit, and my wife will confirm that, this is uh, my mother's dish. She always made that when she knew I needed, you know, to get some pushing upwards. That's schnitzel with carrots, apple salad. So um, this is really my favorite food. I'm, I'm in that for years. So there's still a little bit of German in you then? Absolutely. <laughs> for that, yes. <laughs> but you know, you know what comes second, actually? And that it's, it's cana, you know, it's, the, it's duck. It's southwestern mm. French duck. That, that comes second, but that was later in my life. Interesting. When I was in um, uh, in your neck of the woods, Emmanuel took me to a restaurant and he ordered uh, corps de canard. And I'm like, <laughs> really? And it was, a, it was literally a plate of yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, it's like, interesting. Um, if you weren't making wine and you weren't a consultant, what would you be doing? I think I would be a physician. No, sorry, not a physician, a physics researcher. That's physics a different thing. Yeah. So I was, I was very much into, you know, mathematics, physics, etc. And, um, you know, before applying to all those business schools, I was saying, well, you know, you have those, you know, approval process to get in, etc. I was saying to myself, well, what would you do if they don't take you? Mm. And I was actually enlisting myself in for physics courses. Interesting. So. You are a little bit of, we call it here in the United States, you are a little bit of a rocket scientist then, so. Yeah, it. well, oh, you could also call it a geek, you know. <laughs> your, where's your favorite place to travel? Um, definitely France. Um, and then second comes uh, uh, Norway. Uh, I've, I've spent a fantastic time um, in the, you know, north region, uh, of, of Norway, uppest, uppest region of Norway. I have uh, one of my oldest friends living there and we went there with the family. This is just spectacular. Um, no, that's you great. Know, that, that nights under the sun, etc. This is so great. I love Scandinavia. It's a beautiful part of the world. And last but not least, I think I might, I got an idea that I might know the answer to this one, but I got to ask you anyway, what's your favorite hobby? Um, skiing right after wine. <laughs> Skiing right after. So, <laughs> I totally missed that. <laughs> I totally missed that. Right. No, no, no problem. No, actually, um, um, you know, I'm living here in Munich when I'm not in, 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 in Toulouse and not in Fronton. Um, and this is just a 40 minutes drive to the Alps. So, um, yeah, I go, I go skiing whenever I can do that. Uh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Okay. I have taken up uh, 50 minutes of your time. I'm very, very grateful for it. I want to turn it over to anybody. Um, that has a question. There's a small enough group of us here that we can, you can just unmute yourself and ask. And uh, um, I'll, so I know Diane, you had a question. Um, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hi, Stefan. 
I was wondering what wine you paired with the schnitzel. Uh, actually, the rosé. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, but actually, you know why? This is because the, the um, it's not the schnitzel. The schnitzel goes very well as well with the entry-level wine that Van was uh, referring to earlier, the red one, because it's light and it's fruity. But actually, it's the carrot salad, carrot and, and apple salad, which is quite um, uh, acid in it. Um, so that is better with the rosé. Thank you. So you're putting a lot of vinaigrette in that salad? Um, not a lot, but a, a little bit. It's either um, vinaigrette or it's a citron, it's lemon. Okay. Um, and both basically is, is giving acidity and that with the red one is just kind of you know, destroying the red one. Thank you. Interesting. You're welcome. Anyone else? I have a question. Um, excuse me if you've already said this, but I um, I saw your wine in New Hampshire, and I don't know if Fan you told me this story or if it's just somehow I, I read it. But I heard that you have violets on the property as well, um, something like that. And that kind of always I've been using that as a selling tool I, because I feel like the floralness of the um, and the aroma of the wine it kind of brings that to a head and so um i don't know if that's actually just this, this the aroma or if there's actually violets that are planted nearby that maybe have brought that aroma on somehow yeah so um it's it, this is a good point um we have violets but they have nothing to do with the aroma in the wine Okay. Um, mm -hmm. but, it, but, but that's, that is one of that aromatic characteristics of, uh, of Negret. And just a little trick, actually, if you drink the red wine, um, it's the second smell. So basically you sip the first glass and then if thereafter you just kind of smell once again the, the bouquet, there you will really feel and, and send that uh, um, violet that violet scent, very, very strong. Um, I think in the, in the first nose, you have more of the red fruits and all of that things that come, but the second one is really strong in violet. Typically. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Good, thank you. Great stuff, great question. Anybody else? Um, yeah, Stefan, temperature wise for the rosé, what would you pick as the perfect temperature for drinking your um, rosé? Yeah, actually, the, you know, there's a, a, a very simple rule I, I give, um, which is not, well, it, it's consumer oriented. It's you put the rosé to the refrigerator and you get it out half an hour before serving it. Mm -hmm. That's the perfect temperature. Because actually, you know, otherwise it's too much chilled down. So if it's eight degrees, nine degrees, 10 degrees, it's too much chilled down. And if you... Uh, if you just kind of, you know, have it in a wine cellar, etc., it will be probably, it might be too, too hot. Um, so I cannot translate that into Fahrenheit. I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but it's a very practical recommendation. Well, eight degrees um, Celsius would probably be about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about... Uh, you're, yeah, you're I would, I'm talking about 12 to 15, which would be a good... Uh, a good yes, solar temperature, temperature around 55 to 60 degrees. Yeah, perfect. Um, anybody else have a question? I have a question. Yes. Um, so, Stefan, I'm very happy to, to know you. Um, we are sort of a vice versa, because I'm French, I'm married to a German studied at the university in Toulouse, I live in Reims, oh, okay. and, um, and so I hear you're living in, in München, and uh, yes. we are more Hamburg-oriented in my family, okay. so uh, <laughs> we are sort of uh, yin and yang. Um, um, yes, my question was, you have been talking a lot of, um, of the rosé, is that um, a specific... Um, um, points for Chateau Clemens, or is that a big issue also in the in the appellation? Because when I was in Toulouse twenty years ago, rosé was really not a big thema. So is that really yes. specific for Clemens? Well, um, it is, and right now it became as well for the appellation. Um, so when I started in two thousand twelve. Our own share in production in rosé was perhaps 5%, maximum 10. Um, and um, in the appellation, um, the, the, 
big uh, uh, producers association, they have uh, uh, produced a very low level rosé, which was called um, Piscine. Rosé mm. Piscine. I, I don't know if you heard about that in France. Mm. Um, um, well, this is not wine uh, to my, uh, to my uh, uh, tastings. Um, this is, well, they, they even recommend that you need to put uh, uh, water into it to basically be able to drink it. Um, however, so that was kind of the rosé that was existing. And, and I was, I actually, I read something about the aromatic uh, properties of Negret and about that idea of, you know, being quicker and, and all of that. So I read that in experimental um, journals. And I said, well, we need to do that. We absolutely need to do that. But because I think there is a market for that. And right now we are 35% of our production at Chateau Clamence for all rosé. Wow. With that rosé. So we really increased that portion enormously. Um, and um, now is the fifth year. No, sorry, the sixth year that we have that type of style in rosé. So 2019 was the sixth year now that we have that type of style. And since 2006, well, the, the, the vintage year 2016, 2017, the others started to copy us. So they, they saw actually this is uh, a very good, very different, very ar aromatic and second, there was a market for that. So right now I would think we are something like 15 to 20% rosé in the Appalachian, um, but that has increased dramatically in the last five years. Okay. And do you use a special pressing, special press to, for this um, very yes. specific extraction you've been talking about? Yes, yes, um, yes. Um, so we have, well, you know, that, that was part of the investments I made right at the beginning. Um, so we have a, a pressing um, that has the right volume to what we need. So actually, you know, that needs to be fitting. And the, the, the mechanism is that there is a bag inside that kind of, you know, um, goes up and pushes the grapes so to the outside wall. And that bag has adjustment in pressure of 500 grams. So if you think about, you know, how much weight you push on that grape, so you, you, be, you are exact at the 500 gram exactness on that grape. So actually you push it enough, but not too much. Um, and yes, that was, well, high tech, if you could call that in, in, in that, uh, in that terms, um, and absolutely necessary to produce that type of, of rosé wine. I should, uh, jump in real quick, Stefan, and tell you that, uh, Joël is our enologist that we work with at, uh, Champagne Jacquard and Champagne Montaudon. Okay. Very good. Thank you for all this information. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, does anybody else have any other thoughts, comments, questions? I can't believe Chris Collins doesn't have something to say. The pirate. <laughs> um, nope, I guess not. No, not, uh, nothing in particular. It's always good to see you. Stefan, good to see you again, of course. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, my questions, uh, it's more of a learning process here. Uh, you were talking about Cot, so you you have some Malbec, obviously. Perfect, exactly. That was the grape I was looking for. I, I was thinking that, you know, that's, uh, you know, in France, typically it's a little cool for Malbec, but nevertheless, um, it adds some great character to those wines, even if it's in a smaller percentage than the, uh, than your Negret, uh, at any rate. Yeah, you're you, you're I'm right with that. You're mm -hmm. right with that. But there's a fun fact, you know, on that uh, that that this that, that, that differentiation or comparison with Bordeaux, we have roughly 90 hours more of sun per year than they. Uh, yeah, that's true. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, a little, a little warmer than the uh, cooler Atlantic coast of Bordeaux, no question. So. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we're looking, we're looking forward to hopefully uh, once we get the, all this mess behind us to get an opportunity to sell. Uh, you know, Chateau Clemence uh, uh, out here in California. So it uh, would be good to have an opportunity. And we were going to go over to France in May, uh, of course, and that trip got canceled. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. We're all trying to wait for all of this stuff to get behind us. And we have some uh, some definite um, problems here in the U.S. with our uh, our police departments and, and so forth. That takes uh, another 
chunk of our business away from us. It's difficult to get out in the streets with all the protesters yeah. and so forth. So, but down the road, this this too shall pass, and I, I look forward to having an opportunity to work with you. So, would be great. Thank you, Chris, and and hope to see you soon over here in Europe again. Some very plaisir. Voilà. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I have to say that uh, probably the number one thing that I miss right now um, would be the trips to France. It's, you know, it's a, it, it really is a wonderful place to go and visit. So I'm, I'm ready for this. That's one thing I'm ready for this part of the whole coronavirus experience to end so we can uh, get on an airplane and, and land over at uh, Charles de Gaulle and then get on a train and go take off. Yeah, so. but you know what, what actually the good news is about that? Uh, yesterday night, I was having a chat with, with one of my clients at Siemens, Siemens board member, and he is normally in the U.S., so he was kind of, you know, in the lockdown for the last three months in, in Florida, and he, you know, we, said, we set that up because actually we wanted to meet for dinner, etc., so we, we set up for a telephone conference. He said, you know where I am right now? I said, no, I no, no clue. He said, I'm in Munich, because basically the first plane between the U.S. and Germany took off yesterday morning. Huh. So it seems to start again. It seems to start again. I had a friend that flew from uh, London Heathrow to Las Vegas today. I think okay. he went, I think he went via LAX. But uh, so it's starting. You know, things are going to start to to go and, back. And, and really, I, I'm crossing fingers that this is going to happen very soon because I think this is good for all of us. The yeah. only difference is that there were only four people on the plane, right? Yeah, probably. not at all. Not at all. He said he he was flying business class. Yeah. And he said funny thing, only two free seats. Whoa. And he okay. and he said also interesting uh, fact, lots of families. Huh. Interesting. Very interesting. So, I I really found that interesting. So, yeah. All right, gang. Well, we're going to wrap it up here unless anybody's got a, uh, a last question. We always try to be done in an hour um because uh it's Zoom. <laughs> That's what you do. You wrap up in an hour. Elizabeth, you're muted. You can't. We can't hear you. I was just saying thank you, and I had my screen off because I had to go buy a new laptop today, and I had no idea what I was going to look like <laughs> on the screen because it's in a different place. So <laughs> that's why you saw me like, oh, now I know what to do. So yeah. Super. <laughs> well, Stefan, thank you very much for um, for coming on, and uh, I have to say that was a great education. I really learned a lot. Um, without question, my favorite thing in life is to learn. I, I just love learning from other people and hearing about their experiences and everything. And um, so I'm very fortunate. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at some point over at the winery uh, or perhaps out uh out an accountant and, and doing some work and selling some of your wine we and we will do a good job with your wine thank you very much man it was really fun with you all of you guys thank you very much of, of having thank taken you. your time i hope you saw something because actually you know here in munich we don't have any sun anymore um <laughs> right right okay guys thank you, <laughs> thank you. have a good weekend stay safe thank you thank you, thank you, thank you. Au revoir. Thank you, au revoir. you.